professionally known as Dan, is a professor of medicine at the Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons in the New York Presbyterian Hospital in New York. He is the chair of the executive committee of the International ECMO Network or ECMO Net Research Collaborative and a member of the board of directors and the president elect of the Extracorporeal Life Support Organization, ELSO, who will be following Dr. Payton's leadership in the year to come. I think his hair is starting to turn gray as I mentioned that. Exciting times for ELSO to have these two leaders following each other. It has taken me a few years to get Dan to join us due to scheduling and global invitations, but we got him this year. So the title of Dr. Brody's presentation is ECMO for Respiratory Failure, the Changing Paradigm. I have personally watched ECMO evolve for over 30 years. And again, I am seeing the future that Dr. Brody has been studying and presenting for some time now. We need to pay close attention to this paradigm changes as a profession of multi-specialties. Dr. Brody, thanks for joining us. Bill, uh, thank you for having me. As you said, it's been a number of years we've been trying to coordinate this and I'm uh, really grateful that it worked out. Uh, I've been uh, wanting to uh, be a part of the Sanibel Symposium for some time and I think it's an amazing audience. Uh, and I really appreciate the topic that you gave. So I'm gonna share my screen see if we can get this going. Oh, we're gonna have a little trouble, hold on. Uh, sorry, give me one second. So while I'm uh, changing my system preferences uh, to allow me to do this, um, I, if we have questions, I'm not gonna be able to make the, uh, the afternoon session as I think we discussed, but I'm happy to stay on uh, for a while today and, and answer whatever questions I can. So yeah, that sounds good. We're, we have you talking till 1050. So if there's any time afterward, we'll definitely bring them up. Or I'm sorry, 1150 Eastern. I'm on my own central time here. Uh, 1150, I think, I think 1050 no, 10 Eastern. Because <laughs> otherwise, I'm we're on down. Well, my clock says something different. I suck with time zones. Thanks. Man. <laughs> no worries at all. So uh, the topic that we had uh, talked about was uh, the changing paradigm of ECMO for respiratory failure. And I think exactly as uh, Bill introduced, this is really uh, an exciting time uh, in ECMO. And so what I'll, I'll walk everybody through, um, and you may be familiar with a good amount of this, is where, where has ECMO for respiratory failure gone in recent years? And um, what, what is the evidence that uh, now backs this up, including for COVID, because it's almost impossible to talk about ECMO uh, in 2021 without uh, talking about COVID. Uh, so these are my disclosures and, and relevant to today's talk, I'll, I'll, I will show uh, some of our ECMONET evidence as well as a uh, major study by ELSO that we published uh, last fall. Uh, this is a, a very uh, important paper in the field by uh, Steve Conrad, uh, Bob Bartlett and others. Uh, where uh, we try to nail down the uh, terminology. Most of you have probably seen this. If you haven't, it's worth going through because, uh, and there's a follow-up paper uh, by uh, Mike Broman, uh, really going into the detail of, of how we want to define uh, ECMO. And um, obviously within extracorporeal life support, as we defined it, uh, there's ECMO uh, and ECOR. And I'll be focused because we're talking about respiratory failure, obviously on VV ECMO and, and VV ECOR. Um, this is a, a review article that we put out a few years ago uh, in JAMA. And if you have a chance, if you're interested in this topic, uh, most of, uh, other than COVID, most of what I'll talk about is, is covered in this article. And this is uh, just a, a diagram from the article that I thought uh, many in this audience might appreciate uh, if, uh, if you get a chance to see it. And uh, among the things that we discussed is, what's the mechanism of benefit? So when we're using ECMO for uh, pr principally ARDS, when we're talking about uh, respiratory failure, um, how is it that we benefit the patients? Because that understanding that mechanism helps us to understand our approach. What is it that we might do to benefit the patients? And so um, if you look all the way on the left, and uh, if you can see my mouse, uh, this is minimizing hypoxemia. So obviously those patients who are profoundly hypoxemic, uh, their P to F ratio, meaning their PO2 relative to the FiO2 from the vent, uh, is very low, such as uh, 50 or 40 even, uh, well, those patients are not gonna survive unless we can provide um, in essentially intravenous oxygen, you know, the most basic element of providing ECMO. Um, and by doing that, we decrease tissue hypoxia and can uh, both decrease multi-organ failure and mortality, but also decrease uh, potentially the neurocognitive uh, outcomes of these uh, patients. The same thing we can do using our uh, sweep gases, minimize hypercapnia, which can decrease respiratory acidosis, 
Um, and respiratory acidosis uh, increases pulmonary uh, artery pressures, which increases right ventricular afterload and uh, can uh, affect your cardiac output and therefore uh, also more multi-organ uh, uh, functioning. If we look all the way to the right, we can re reduce what's now called diaphragm myotrauma meaning trauma to the uh, muscle of the diaphragm itself, which uh, if we can improve di uh, diaphragm function, ultimately we can get patients off a ventilator sooner and decrease the complications from a ventilator. But the, the area to focus on the most is this one, minimizing lung stress and strain. So what is it that we actually do once we put a patient on ECMO for uh, ARDS? We decrease the tidal volumes, we decrease the airway pressures, even the respiratory rate and what's called the driving pressure, uh, which is the difference between the plateau pressure and the PEEP. It's what drives the, uh, the volume of air into the lungs. And by decreasing that, we decrease the injury that we cause the lungs, by, which is normally done through a ventilator by uh, imparting energy to the lungs. The more we can decrease that, uh, the more we can uh, prevent what, all these traumas that we cause to the lungs, volume trauma, barrow trauma, Adelect trauma and biotrauma. What, what those really mean is by, by uh, inflating the lungs with positive pressure, especially when they're injured, um, the volumes and pressures that we deliver can cause injury. The repeated opening and closing, uh, what's called adelect trauma, uh, can also be injurious to the lungs. And then it releases inflammatory mediators into the body. And this is what's known as biotrauma because those mediators can then go and affect other organs besides just the lungs. And that's why patients. Uh, with ARDS often die of multi-organ failure and not just respiratory failure. So it's very important if we're going to understand the, the mechanism, then we understand how do we want to approach these patients? Well, we're going to want to decrease volumes, pressures, and respiratory rate uh, such that we uh, decrease the stress and strain on the lungs. Um, I just put this out there. This is very well known to all of you, but um, we have to emphasize that ECMO is not benign and that uh, this is a listing of complications. What we did is we included uh, uh, complications by um, organ system. Uh, these are the medical or mechanical complications, device complications on the right. Everything in the ELSO registry with percentage uh, is in the white boxes. Everything that's uh, grayed out uh, are additional uh, complications that, uh, that aren't necessarily tracked uh, in the ELSO registry that we also wanted to highlight. Um, very importantly, and, and not news to any of you, is that uh, ECMO is being used much more frequently now than it was previously, as, uh, as Matt was just uh, describing in terms of the ELSA registry. This is the case volume from the registry, and you can see starting in 2009, which we all know was the confluence of events of the uh, CSER trial being published by Giles Peak, um, as well as the uh, H1N1 influenza pandemic, you can see that there's an increase in all cases of ECMO, uh, primarily adult, really very little change at that time in pediatric or neonatal. We've seen some shifts. Um, and that it's pretty evenly split between adult uh, cardiac and adult respiratory with a, a little bit of extra cardiac coming from adult eCPR. So a dramatic increase in a short period of time. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to plot out was the number of publications that are being uh, um, uh, appearing on PubMed uh, each year. And you can see again, around 2009, you can see a sudden and pretty dramatic increase in the number of publications from really what was just a few hundred a year to now what will probably be around 3,000 publications about ECMO this year. Uh, but of course, publishing about ECMO doesn't mean that we're publishing really good uh, literature. And we have to think about what the quality of that literature is that informs our practice. So you don't, don't have to know uh, too much about this table, except that going through the different things that we use ECMO for on the respiratory failure side. Uh, looking at whether it's a clinical indication like very severe ARDS or a research indication, like more moderate forms of the ARDS. And then what's the highest level of evidence? And for these two, it's randomized controlled trials. Um, however, the only clinical indication with randomized trials uh, is uh, severe ARDS. So I'm gonna focus on severe ARDS because that's really where we have our data. And frankly, it's the bulk of the patients that we put on for respiratory failure. Um, so again, looking at this as the highest level of evidence uh, that we currently have. And you know, in the modern era, the uh, major study that first came out um, is the, the CSER trial uh, by Giles Peak, as I mentioned. So just very briefly, it's a randomized controlled trial of 180 adults. They had severe but potentially reversible respiratory failure. And um, this is the uh, uh, result of the trial. Um, this was a, a trial that didn't randomize patients to either getting ECMO or not getting ECMO. They either uh, received, uh, uh, or excuse me, uh, stayed at the center where they were and received conventional management with a ventilator, 
or they were randomized to being uh, moved over to one hospital, Glenfield Hospital in Leicester in the United Kingdom. That's where Giles Peake and his team were. Um, and they were randomized to go there to be considered for ECMO. So they didn't necessarily get ECMO, they were considered for ECMO because very appropriately, if they were already too sick to benefit, they were moribund, they weren't given ECMO. And also if they were improving appropriately, they were not given ECMO. So only 76% of the patients who were randomized to the ECMO arm actually received ECMO. So that's just one thing to keep in mind about the trial. The other is that there were, uh, you know, it was a, an amazing accomplishment. It was a very difficult trial to pull off, um, but uh, in being a pragmatic trial, that's the trial design that was required by the National Health Service in the UK, they allowed the centers that were conventionally managing the patients with a ventilator to not have to do what's considered standard of care to go to low volume, low pressure ventilation. And only 70% of those patients at any point received what's considered standard of care in that sense. And so if that's the case, you, if you're not providing the highest level standard of care in the control arm of a randomized controlled trial, you bias the results in favor of the intervention arm, in this case, the arm that might have received ECMO. And so this result, which is um, a huge difference between the ECMO arm uh, in red and uh, the conventional arm in blue, um, you can see is a 16% absolute reduction in the primary endpoint, which was death or severe disability at six months. And so that's a, a major accomplishment. And yet with these caveats, um, about the, the care delivered to the control arm and the fact that this wasn't ECMO versus no ECMO, the results weren't definitive. It definitely showed that ECMO was safe in the modern era. And this is even with roller pumps. Um, but the benefit of ECMO really seemed to be, uh, as we could define it from this trial, confined to use at expert centers as part of a larger management algorithm. So a very important trial, but maybe not definitive for whether or not ECMO actually saves lives. And to answer that question, um, we think we needed the EOLIA trial. Uh, this is by Alan Combs, uh, the Riva Research Group, uh, and our ECMOnet, uh, where we did a multi-center international randomized controlled trial of 249 adults uh, with ARDS. So the, the largest trial to date um, in, in the ECMO space, although um, very soon the REST trial uh, will be published uh, of ECOR for ARDS. So stay tuned for that. That should come out uh, in just the next few weeks. Uh, but this was published in the New England Journal in 2018. And so here you could be either randomized to an ECMO center or a non-ECMO center, transferred to an ECMO center. But all of these centers uh, had extensive expertise in managing ARDS. So low volume, low pressure ventilation was provided to anybody who didn't receive ECMO. And you either uh, were randomized to receive it or not to receive it. Uh, these were the criteria. And I think it's very important to understand these criteria because it, uh, if this is a positive trial or we view it as positive, then these are the criteria we should use for putting people on ECMO for ARDS. So the first criteria is a P to F ratio less than 50 for at least three hours. And that's, that just signals that these are incredibly hypoxemic patients. There were very few of them in the trial. We don't see a lot of these patients, uh, but when we do, we try to rescue them. The P to F ratio less than 80 for at least six, uh, six hours uh, was the most common criteria. And then there's this last category, which people tend to think of as uh, you know, less traditional, maybe not as uh, clean, but it's actually uh, probably the most important criteria. And that's if the patients are very, have very stiff lungs, then it's very hard to ventilate them, meaning we can't keep their PCO2 normal, so it's at least 60, which drops their pH below 725. And that's despite going up on the respiratory rate to 35 and allowing the plateau pressure to be relatively high. So if their lungs are very stiff, that's a, a reasonable criteria, even if the PDF ratio uh, is not uh, lower. Um, there were 124 patients assigned to receive ECMO, 125 uh, were assigned to receive uh, conventional management. It's important to note that of the patients who were assigned to, to not get ECMO, 35 of them, 28% were received ECMO. In other words, the, the doctors who were caring for them just couldn't sit on them, felt that ECMO might save them, and they had to meet very strict criteria, but they did cross over to ECMO, which weakens the strength of the trial. Uh, the trial was stopped for uh, futility. Um, but had a, a very uh, remarkable result, which is an 11% reduction in mortality from 46 to 35. Um, that's an absolute reduction at 60 days uh, after uh, initiating ECMO. And so uh, a very impressive decrease in mortality, and yet the p-value for the trial was not positive. Again, because uh, relatively small numbers, uh, it was aimed at a very big uh, difference in mortality, and a lot of patients crossed over. Uh, it's important to note that uh, bleeding uh, was uh, common in these patients. Uh, you can see more common in the ECMO patients, 46% as compared to the 28. Um, and we can see here, though, that um, to, a little bit to everybody's surprise, stroke was actually less common in the ECMO group. And in fact, ischemic stroke occurred in six patients in the control group and none uh, in the ECMO group. Uh, hemorrhagic stroke in five patients uh, in the control group and only three 
uh, in the ECMO group. So we think of ECMO as being associated uh, with uh, stroke, but it's not entirely clear that in this population uh, that that's uh, due to the ECMO, it may just be that they are sick patients. So uh, based on that p-value, uh, this is the conclusion of the study, uh, among patients with very severe ARDS, the 60-day mortality was not significantly lower, significantly lower, it was lower, uh, with ECMO than with the strategy of mechanical ventilation. That's how we had to conclude for the New England Journal. However, uh, this is an editorial uh, that accompanied the article, um, David Harrington and Jeff Drazen. Jeff Drazen was the editor in chief at the time of the New England Journal, David Harrington's statistical editor. And they wrote that it's important to remember that we can still learn something positive from what we had uh, concluded was a negative trial. And that ECMO probably has some benefit in this context. Now, it's very confusing for the editors to require us to say it's a negative trial, but say that it probably has some benefit. And the, that sort of thinking suggests that uh, even though the results are negative, seeing that huge difference in mortality, we actually sort of believe in our hearts that this is, um, that the trial is showing us a positive result. And that's what's called Bayesian analysis. Bayesian analysis takes into account our prior beliefs, our understandings of the way uh, we approach something. We don't take out our judgment. Um, we actually try to quantify it. And so uh, with Ewan Goliger, uh, we did this trial published in JAMA soon after uh, EOLIA, where we looked at uh, a Bayesian analysis after the fact of that uh, EOLIA data. And this is uh, complex. So uh, needless to say, what uh, this really shows, and this is uh, for those who know uh, uh, Bayesian analysis, that um, the prior probability you're thinking uh, prior to the uh, results of EOLIA um, would change based on the results. And if you started as somebody who was strongly enthusiastic about ECMO, you think it saves everybody's life. Well, maybe it wasn't as good as you thought, but it was still very positive. Whereas on this side, if you were strongly skeptical of ECMO and you thought it was just as likely killing people as helping them, um, that it actually uh, made you believe that uh, ECMO is very likely to be helping patients. And so the results of this suggest that regardless of your prior assumptions about ECMO, the probability of any mortality benefit is actually 88 to 99%. Meaning if you were at the bedside with a family, you could say, well, the Yodia trial was negative, but the likelihood that it's gonna benefit the mortality of your family member is 88 to 99%, 88, even if you don't think that, didn't think beforehand that it works. So it would be very hard in an appropriate patient to say that this does not benefit mortality. Several other studies have come out since and have reinforced this. This is by Levina Munchi and Eddie Fan. Uh, published in Lancet Respiratory Medicine. And what they did is what's, you know, systematic review and meta-analysis. They looked at five studies, including the two randomized trials, Caesar and Eolia, and three observational studies. Their primary outcome was, was tagged to just the two RCTs. Um, and looking at that, this is called a forest plot where um, anything to the left of this uh, line uh, suggests that it favors ECMO, anything to the right would favor conventional ventilation. And this strongly favors ECMO where the mortality would be 34% with ECMO and 47% uh, without it. Uh, Alain Combs uh, also did this, it's called an individual patient data meta-analysis, looking at the data combined between Eolia and, uh, and um, Caesar, uh, along with Giles Peak, and they again showed a benefit to ECMO. Uh, finally, this uh, network uh, meta-analysis of randomized trials, this was looking at uh, the trials in ARDS by Sachin Sood. Uh, this is just a fancy way of comparing various different therapies within the same area. So for ARDS and seeing which ones, uh, if you break down all the trials are actually most beneficial and prone positioning with low tidal volume ventilation was the best strategy, but the, uh, one of the very strong strategies was VB ECMO uh, rated among the best with a good relative risk. Um, so at the end of the, of the JAMA study where we did the Bayesian analysis, the editors for JAMA now again also weighed in themselves. Um, and they said that clinicians and researchers should no longer ask, does ECMO work? Again, this is with the imprimatur of, of JAMA on it because that question appears to be answered. And instead the key question that we should now be asking is by how much does ECMO work in whom and at what cost? So in other words, with this data from Eolia um, and with all of the other data that I've shown you, the, it is uh, now at least more mainstream outside of the ECMO community to uh, assess that ECMO really does benefit mortality in the setting of appropriate patients with ARDS. And now it's on us to begin to understand uh, more of the details of that data. So when should we use ECMO for ARDS? This is the algorithm uh, for ARDS. We published this in Lancet Respiratory Medicine a few, couple of years ago. Um, you know, basically treat the underlying cause. I mean, still, if it's from pneumonia, you want to give antibiotics. Uh, lung protective ventilation, 
uh, resuscitate the patient. If their P to F is less than 150, prone positioning is the standard of care that's now become much more commonly used uh, in the setting of COVID. Um, neuromuscular blockade, high peep strategies, all sorts of other things. But in the end, if after all of that, they qualify for one of the criteria for, for EOLIA uh, without any contraindications, then that's when ECMO would be recommended. So how should we manage ECMO uh, specific to COVID-19 related ARDS? And so this is obviously a very hot topic because this is much of what we've been uh, seeing for uh, more than just the last year uh, uh, throughout the United States and throughout the world. Um, so this is a paper we published with Eddie Fan, again, Lance Respiratory Medicine, where there were many suggestions that we should treat the ARDS of COVID very differently, but there's really no evidence for that. In fact, so far, the evidence suggests that ARDS with COVID should be treated the same way as ARDS uh, without COVID. And of course, that may change over time, but until there's evidence to the contrary, we should continue to use the evidence-based algorithm that I just showed you. So the same approach in the setting of, of COVID. Um, so what's the role for ECMO and uh, COVID-19 related ARDS? So let's look at some of the data that's come out. This is uh, from Paris. This was one of the first uh, major studies to come out uh, in Lancet Respiratory Medicine. This is by Mathieu Schmidt and Alain Combe. And what they did is they looked at the Paris Sorbonne University Hospital Network. So essentially five ICUs throughout Paris uh, where they were treating ECMO for COVID-19 associated ARDS. And they had follow up to 60 days. Um, notably, they included 83 patients, and 79 of those patients are from the very famous hospital, La, uh, La Pitié Salpêtrière, which is the hospital of Mathieu Schmidt and Alain Combe. Uh, so it was very much their ICU, plus a, a few from the other ICUs. Uh, this is uh, just a way of depicting the mortality. Uh, these are the patients over time who died. These are the ones who are alive and out of ICU, but because at 60 days, not everybody had finished their course and they were trying to report it so that we would have that data, some of these patients uh, in the light blue are still in the ICU, but off ECMO, and these very few patients were still on ECMO. 31% probability of 60-day uh, mortality was what's estimated, so very similar to EOLIA, and 36% uh, at 90 days. Um, this is hot off the presses, just published uh, uh, online on Sunday, is the experience from Chile. And I would really like to point out that um, one of the most important uh, aspects of this study is that the Chilean government, along with their clinicians, got together and public health officials, and they created a single uh, uh, COVID ECMO uh, mechanism for dealing with patients throughout the entire country. And I think they should be uh, applauded for doing this under the difficult circumstances that we've all lived through. Um, it was really a, a massive effort and I think a model for uh, the rest of the world. Uh, this has uh, been published uh, online now uh, in the uh, American Journal of Respiratory Critical Care Medicine, what we know as the Blue Journal. And again, it's a nationwide Chilean cohort um, from March through August. Uh, and they linked all the national data agencies to come up with 94 ECMO patients and then looked very carefully at 85 of those 94. And the 90-day mortality under extreme stress uh, down in Chile was also 38.8%, very similar to what we had seen uh, in the cohorts uh, pre-COVID uh, pre and from the uh, Paris experience. And you can see that here. Uh, uh, this also is uh, looking at the difference between those who are put on ECMO uh, after uh, 10 days. Uh, that's um, uh, here, uh, excuse me, uh, late ECMO onset, this is uh, probability of survival, uh, and early ECMO onset. You can see that uh, technically there's uh, no difference um, uh, in the, uh, you know, statistically, um, but you can see that uh, uh, the probability of survival is still quite good in those uh, greater than 10 days. Um, what about uh, complications uh, in uh, uh, their study? It's just important to note that they saw all the complications that we normally see. Um, and uh, that uh, nonetheless, they uh, still had uh, excellent results. Uh, one further experience uh, uh, to show you before showing the international experience, this is uh, from the Stop COVID investigators uh, in the United States, looking at 190 COVID-19 patients who received ECMO at 35 hospitals. Uh, they looked at day 60 uh, outcomes uh, where 33% uh, uh, had died, 49% had been discharged and 17% uh, remained hospitalized. Importantly, what they did is they then uh, did fancy statistical analysis to emulate uh, a target trial, meaning uh, it, they, they simulated doing a randomized controlled trial for patients within seven days of ECMO for a PDF of 100, less than 100, which is a little bit generous, but the mortality of those patients was estimated with ECMO to be 34.6% and without it to be 47.4%. Again, very consistent uh, data. And that's shown here where the ECMO group clearly did better uh, in the um, uh, line above. And that brings us to the international experience. Again, this is uh, the ELSO 
uh, experience that I was referring to. And I want to really highlight my colleagues, Ryan Barbaro, Graham McLaren, and Phil Boonstra, who did a tremendous amount of work on this. Uh, this is based on the ELSO registry and uh, an addendum that we created specifically for COVID-19, such that uh, right away we had an, an early cohort to evaluate. So this looks at the first 1,035 COVID-19 ECMO patients from 213 centers across 36 countries. And we wanted to review the epidemiology hospital course and outcomes. Um, using a multivariable Cox model uh, so that we could uh, look uh, up to 90 days of follow-up from uh, ECMO initiation. Now, in the ELSA registry, there's no follow-up after hospital discharge, so we don't know what happens. Uh, we only know if they left the hospital alive um, or went to uh, another hospital or facility. And in the end, the estimated cumulative incidence of in-hospital mortality 90 days after starting ECMO was 37.4%. Again, the data was very consistent. This is all from the first wave, uh, variably defined. In this case, um, from uh, the very beginning in January uh, until uh, you could be initiated on ECMO as of May 1st. Um, and uh, among those who were only who, who had an actual final disposition, actually uh, died or been discharged home, uh, the mortality was very similar. Uh, again, this is just looking at a similar, what's called stacked bar plot uh, that we saw from the Parisian data. Again, these are the patients who died, these are home. Um, what you can see though, is that uh, these are patients who are discharged, for instance, to an LTAC. Uh, these are discharged to another hospital and these are patients uh, unknown. Here are just the very few who are hospitalized. So th this is, we can only estimate the mortality through statistics we can't know because we didn't have final outcomes on those patients. And that, that may be important. Uh, again, here just uh, plotting out the uh, cumulative incidence of mortality at 37%. Um, what factors were associated with in-hospital mortality? Because we have a large database, you can really begin to understand which patients might or might not benefit from ECMO in the setting of COVID. Um, up here is age by uh, decade of life, 40s, 50s, 60s, and greater than 70. And you can see um, that the mortality increases substantially with increasing age. Uh, immunocompromised patients didn't do as well. Those with chronic respiratory disease, um, if they had cardiac arrest prior to going on ECMO, uh, for obvious reasons, they didn't do as well. And if their initial mode was venoarterial or venovenous arterial instead of VV, um, they also didn't do as well. Uh, this is from the EuroELSO branch, uh, led by uh, a survey led by Roberto Russo uh, and Jan Belolovic on behalf of uh, the EuroELSO, uh, where they did prospective data collection from the middle of March through the middle of September. And this is both ELSO and non-ELSO centers that were attracted to do this. And so they have 1,500 patients at 177 centers throughout Europe. Um, this is a, a larger uh, cohort, but with uh, less detailed data it was done through a survey, not through the registry, but uh, very nice complementary data. Uh, the mean uh, age was 52. Most patients were men and the vast majority of VV ECMO. Uh, the mean ECMO support was 18 days, ICU length of stay 33 days. Their mortality a little bit higher, but uh, given the uh, spread across so many centers, uh, not substantially higher at 45%. Um, one other study that I'd like to show you, uh, and that takes a little bit of a different approach, and I think is important to have heard of, uh, is this uh, letter that was published in JAMA Surgery by Asif Mustafa and colleagues from uh, Rush University and Advocate Christ in Chicago. It's only 40 patients, uh, so take it with a grain of salt. Um, but I'll show you their outcomes, and they're really quite good. So I think we all need to take a step back and think about what is it that they did that might have better uh, outcomes. And uh, the, um, a lot of people have focused on the use of the Protect Duo, the RA to PA uh, double wound catheter that um, many use as an RVED, but can obviously be used as an oxy RVED. Um, and that may be the secret sauce. That may be what's giving them such good uh, outcomes. However, they really used a package of interventions, not just the Protect Duo. They used direct thrombin inhibitors instead of uh, heparin. They used uh, glucocorticoids at higher dose than the current protocol and still do. Um, they used inhaled nitri nitric oxide in all patients, and their goal was to get patients awake and extubated and doing physical therapy. So somewhere in that package of interventions, um, they were able to accomplish uh, quite a bit. So you can see here over time, up to 40 is the number of patients who are on ECMO. Um, these are the patients as they were able to extubate them over time, decannulate them, discharge them from the ICU and discharge from hospital. And the difference here are those patients, 11 of them who were still in the hospital at the time that they reported. So they reported 15% uh, uh, mortality, but in a follow-up letter, they had everybody uh, who, uh, all 40 patients had complete reporting and still they only had a 17.5% mortality. Again, it's a very small study. It's unclear exactly what the difference, uh, you know, what made the difference in their interventions, but it is something for us uh, to keep an eye on. 
Uh, another thing I'd like to point out uh, uh, is that here's the data that we uh, showed you from our Lancet respiratory, uh, or excuse me, from the Lancet study from the ELSO registry, 37.4% mortality. But on the uh, ELSO website, we've uh, maintained, uh, as we get up into the many thousands of patients with uh, COVID-19 who've been put on ECMO, uh, we uh, follow the, the uh, mortality in real time. And here you can see that it's climbed up to 49%, it went even a little bit higher, now, now it's back down around there. This includes that original thousand. So actually, since this original population, mortality has been considerably higher. So in other words, somewhere in whatever you wanna call it, depending on where you are in the world, the second wave, the third wave, the fourth wave, uh, the mortality is substantially higher than it was in what we all call the first wave. And uh, so we're looking at that data now, we should have that published hopefully in the coming weeks um, so that you can uh, see it. We're gonna uh, publish it hopefully just as a letter so we get the basic data out there as quickly as possible. But it is something to keep in mind and I think it's uh, the reason uh, I wanted to look at this data is because I was hearing from people all over the world uh, that they were having a similar experience to what we were, uh, which is that the outcomes were not the same as we saw in the spring. And even though we were under such tremendous pressure uh, in New York, among other places, uh, we had better outcomes. And so the question is why are outcomes worsening? We don't have the answer, but it may be because uh, patients are now being treated with steroids. And the patients who we are uh, seeing who go on ECMO are only those who are refractory to steroids, whereas the ones we saw in the spring uh, were patients who were receiving uh, steroids um, uh, in much lower doses and maybe receive them once they were on it. Uh, similarly, we're now providing a lot more high flow uh, nasal cannula and a lot more uh, non-invasive ventilation of, of various sorts prior to even being intubated. And it might be that the lung injury uh, accumulates during that time uh, due to patients who are, are breathing very hard by the time they get on the vent, let alone on ECMO, uh, they might already be much sicker. And of course, viral variants and various other factors may be at play here. And so it's just something to keep in mind because that should change the way we approach uh, these patients, if, uh, if everybody survived with ECMO, uh, we would offer it to everyone uh, as long as we had the resource to do it. If everyone died, we'd offer it to no one. So as the mortality changes, we do need to reconsider who we're offering it to and how strict we're being with our criteria. Um, so just to uh, close out, in terms of the use of uh, ECMO, uh, we should think about it as part of the ARDS algorithm and clearly more evidence is needed, but how should we actually use it? Well, uh, the, what I would recommend is using the EOLIA trial procedures, totally reasonable to do what they did Caesar as well. Um, percutaneous BV cannulation, low dose anticoagulation, uh, typically with unfractionated heparin, although that remains a matter of debate, at relatively low doses. And this is what we used in the EOLIA trial in terms of uh, monitoring. Um, the blood flow rate and the FDO2, the fraction of delivered oxygen coming from the uh, device, uh, should target a PAO2. Uh, this is what we did in EOLIA. So something like this is appropriate, but this is definitive. Um, there aren't good trials comparing uh, this approach to others, but keeping a SAD above 90, uh, you know, a, a arterial oxygen saturation and the sweep gas flow for PACO2, typically in the ARDS population, you know, less than 45, usually uh, also looking at the pH. Um, the ventilator is, uh, was set in the uh, trial, uh, volume assist control for a plateau pressure of 24 or less, so less than 25, uh, with a PEEP of at least 10, although uh, typically in the 10 to 15 range. Um, you could also use uh, pressure control ventilation uh, in the EOLIA trial, what's called APRV, um, but uh, really was sort of a bi-level with, a, again, a, a high pressure of 24 and a low pressure, uh, at least 10. Uh, and an IDE ratio of one to two. That was only used in a few patients uh, in the OLEO trial, although the Paris COVID experience, uh, most of those patients were, were trialed on that. Uh, the FiO2 on the ventilator, not the FDO2 on the uh, device is turned down uh, to uh, 30 to 50% typically. We did the respiratory rate of 10 to 30. I think we were to redo the trial today. I know actually we would uh, aim in those patients uh, in whom we control the respiratory rate when they're sedated and paralyzed, um, we would aim for less than 10. When and how to use ECMO for ARDS? Well, uh, finally, I would just say, uh, follow the EOLIA criteria that we discussed uh, and as outlined here and uh, apply it in the setting of the ARDS algorithm uh, when it is indicated and when there are no contraindications. Uh, thank you very much and I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Terrific, Dr. Brody, thank you, thank you, thank you for that lecture um, you brought you brought it to the table as usual we have a couple of minutes what I want to uh, oh actually we have about uh, 15 minutes I guess for questions and I've been collecting them from the audience but um, can you tell me uh, first of all your lung protective strategies when I get out and around and about 
uh, I don't see that being preserved uh, as well as what you and the other researchers in the OLEA trial have uh, demonstrated to be beneficial in outcomes. Um, well, uh, you know, I see modes, VDR modes, I see, um, uh, you know, plateau pressures greater than 29 or so. Um, so do we, how do we sell that when we believe in it? How do we sell that to the physicians? And also, could you say something about extubation on BV ECMO in your practices as well, as far as percentage of uh, patients that you're able to do that with? Um, thank you. Uh, all right. So several questions in one, I'll take it. Uh, the, the first is, uh, I would be um, reluctant to say that there's anything wrong with using something like VDR. Um, you know, it's a different approach. It just hasn't been studied. So for the purists, you go with the evidence. The evidence suggests that we should use uh, either volume control uh, or, you know, APRV as a really bi-level as outlined in Eolia or pressure control as outlined in Caesar. Um, uh, and then keeping the volumes and pressures and the respiratory rate as I described. Um, that doesn't mean that's the best approach. It hasn't been compared to other approaches. And so, you know, if a center is very experienced with something like VDR, and I would suggest that you should have the experience and shouldn't just be trying that um, because there isn't evidence for it, I wouldn't um, recommend it, but I definitely wouldn't recommend against it. If you have a lot of experience, that or uh, NAVA or other forms of ventilation, depending on where the patient is in their course can be uh, potentially very helpful. Um, for uh, true high frequency oscillatory ventilation, uh, there is there are two major randomized controlled trials published in the New England Journal, which suggested, one suggested no benefit, one suggested harm. With those specific protocols, it also doesn't mean that there's no way to use those to benefit patients, but I would be reluctant to use those uh, in these patients. So um, what about, uh, where's the, the only right answer? This is, I, I take this directly from Bob Bartlett. So, I, you know, it's gotta be true. Uh, Bob will tell you, when he goes to visit a center, the only thing he'll, uh, the only thing about the vent he'll tell them is wrong is if they don't go down on the volumes and pressures. So there's just no point in giving somebody the complications of ECMO or the potential complications if we don't take advantage of the fact that we're removing CO2. If we can remove the CO2 directly from the blood, we can ventilate less. If we don't remove CO2, that's, that's what stops us from using very low volumes and pressures because we have to ventilate the lungs to get rid of CO2 or the patient dies, right? Their pH just goes lower and lower and lower but with ECMO, we don't have to. And so the one wrong answer is to stay at high volumes and high pressures during ECMO for uh, ARDS. And uh, everybody should be encouraged to go down now. To go down to what? Well, do you wanna follow Eolia? Do you wanna follow Caesar? They're very similar protocols. Um, do you wanna go even lower, right? Do you wanna to go to a total pressure less than 20? Uh, we uh, do that in some of our patients. In fact, in some of them, we're essentially not ventilating the patients because they're so stiff and they've collapsed so much that they get you know, total uh, tidal volumes of 50 cc's or 10 cc's, essentially absolutely no tidal volume. And you might as well just shut off the ventilator. We keep the ventilator on to keep um, positive end expiratory pressure to maintain some patency of the alveoli, but there's really no absolute right answer. There's only one wrong answer. And that really is staying at high volumes and pressures. We know it damages the lungs and this whole concept of resting the lungs, which is very amorphous. It doesn't have a definition, but as a concept is right. We need to rest the lungs. We need to not damage them in the way that we have to without ECMO, but don't have to with ECMO. So the one thing I would really encourage is that regardless of how you approach it, that you do choose to have some lung protective strategy beyond our standard of care. Um, and you know what we tend to call ultra protective uh, lung ventilation with very low volumes and very low pressures, less than was used in the, uh, for instance, the uh, ARDSNET ARMA trial, which is the standard of care in the US. There's another trial called Express, which is often used in France, um, just different protocols for getting at the exact same thing, which is minimizing volumes of pressures. But there's only so much you can minimize it without ECMO. With ECMO, that's the advantage. Again, there's no right answer about whether we should completely stop ventilation, apneic ventilation, but they're just on CPAP of 10. Um, that's been studied. That was a nice trial out of Toronto, uh, looking at, uh, it was one of our ECMONET studies, looking at uh, cytokine release, which is less when you don't deliver tidal volumes. But that, I wouldn't recommend that as a, a current clinical strategy because we just don't have enough information on what it means to stop ventilating the lungs altogether. So there are many potential right answers. Um, I think, if, again, for those of us who are purists, we go with the data that we have. Eolia did not compare those ventilator settings against any others. So it didn't give us the answer, but what it did say is if we do those ventilator settings in the appropriate patients, we will improve mortality. Um, so that I think is probably, in my mind, the best answer, but there are a lot of, I think, good answers. In terms of extubation uh, of patients, very controversial. 
Um, so, you know, we were among the first to really start doing that. Uh, but we started primarily in our bridge to transplant patients where it's become standard of care because in lung transplant in particular, uh, even more than heart transplant, these patients have to be in good shape prior to uh, their transplant. They don't do well. And that's just a fact And most transplant centers won't really consider them if they've been on a ventilator unconscious for, you know, two weeks. Uh, they have to be awake and they have to be robust enough to withstand the transplant. And for those areas of the country and the world where uh, getting lungs is difficult, as it is for us in New York, um, there are areas where, you know, lungs for people at the top of the list on ECMO come in three days. But those patients, you know, they can be asleep for a little bit and will still be robust enough. But we often wait at least two weeks and sometimes many months. Uh, and during that time, the patients have to be awake and extubated and walking around the ICU or walking around the hospital. So that's a very different category. But by doing that, we learned to do it um, as a routine. And back in the old days, you know, a decade ago, we used to walk more of our patients with ARDS. But our average time on ECMO was around nine, 10 days for ARDS. And so by the time I got them awake and, you know, off of sedation, off of paralytics, um, you know, because I wanted to keep them quiet those first few days to let their lungs rest, well, it was already day five, day six, day seven. Uh, and now I'm going to get them off at day 10. So by the time I get them out of bed and walking, it's going to be a day. So was that worth the risk for a day of a little bit of mobilization? And it may be, I don't know the answer to that. And there's a nice randomized pilot trial, another one of our Equinet studies by Carol Hodgson, looking at uh, the safety and feasibility of getting these patients out of bed. Uh, and uh, it's very instructive, but there's still a lot of uh, questions that remain. So then fast forward to you know, populations like COVID where they're on for a long period of time. Well, there actually might be more benefit in those patients because uh, these are like our other critically ill patients. Um, these are patients who are, you know, it's gonna be a while that they could be awake and doing this. And again, I think that's where the Chicago data is very instructive. A lot of us have struggled with our COVID patients and I, I don't want anybody to get the sense that this is easy. Even the Chicago folks will tell you they struggle getting these patients awake. Um, they often have a very high respiratory drive. So getting them awake and extubated can be challenging, but they pushed us to say it's possible. And they have done it in the majority of patients. And they've now done over a hundred patients like that. Although just like our mortality, their mortality has gone up still it's below everybody else, but their mortality has gone up. So I think they're seeing the same trends, but they're still seeing uh, some positive results. Whether the extubation and ambulation is part of their good results um, is unclear, but uh, it's certainly intuitively appealing as long as you can do it safely. So I would suggest that those two uh, categories, what we used to call ECMO version 2.0, you know, sort of the modern ECMO where you could use ECMO to extubate patients and walk them around the ICU, all of that uh, is, you know, it sounds great and it's very sexy and we all love it, but make sure you have the expertise in ECMO. This isn't something you do day one of your brand new program and make sure you have the expertise and the staff to be able to do the mobilization because without those two things, um, it's, you know, it can be pretty uh, unsafe. Uh, and in fact, have disastrous consequences. Whereas if you feel comfortable with both, you know, we've shown, and we have a, a paper that uh, hopefully will come out in the next couple of months, um, where uh, we, it's by far the largest experience of walking patients. And we've walked many patients with femoral cannulation, including femoral VA, um, you know, without, with minimal complications, you know, a couple of uh, real complications, but in thousands of episodes of, of mobilization. So um, it is definitely possible to do both of those things. Uh, I would say it's uh, uh, probably beneficial in selected patients. We don't know exactly who those patients are. You should only do it at your center if you have the comfort level to do it or building the comfort level slowly and carefully um, and should probably speak to centers that have that experience to um, you know, maybe uh, benefit from some of, the, uh, uh, you know, some of the experience that they've gained over the years. How about the benefits of trach? Trach, uh, you, you got some good questions. Uh, trach, trach, we just have no idea, no idea. So we have a, a large study, Mathieu Schmidt from Paris uh, is putting together a large study called TRACHMO. Uh, for trach on ECMO. And uh, it's actually, uh, the data is being analyzed uh, and it's a multi-center study from around the world to really begin to understand what the practices are. We don't even know what people do, uh, let alone what's beneficial. And there's certainly no randomized trials in ECMO, you know, when to trach them, whom to trach, who's gonna benefit the most from trach. Um, practices vary massively across the world. I mean, this isn't like, you know, small differences in practices between, you know, centers. And so, we really don't have a right answer. And I, I think, you know, there are some centers where, uh, you know, some people swear by percutaneous, some swear by open, um, you know, some people say it should always be done early. Some say, you know, we should never do it. Uh, it it's all over the map. It's all over the map. And I don't think there's a right answer. 
um, you know, it, even within our center there, you know, it, often it, uh, it's a little bit team dependent, you know, it depends on uh, the surgeon is on and the medical team that's on, um, and, but it's always a conversation. So why do we think the patient's going to benefit from trach is really uh, the issue. You know, do we think it's because it'll help wake them up? Uh, that might be helpful. Is it, you know, tons and tons of secretions that we just can't manage? Okay, that, that might be helpful. Um, you know, so, you know, it's thinking about that. If, they, if this is a TBI patient who's on ECMO for ARDS, uh, trach them. You know, if they're a bad TBI patient, trach them day two, you know, day one. Um, you might want to trach them right after you put them on because that's not a patient who's going to wake up for a while. And, you know, a trach is probably indicated uh, if it's a serious TBI. Um, whereas for many of the other patients, um, we get away with not traching them at all. And I think in the end, that's probably the right uh, answer, but I have no idea. When you trach them, does that prevent you from proning while on ECMO? No, uh, it's a really good question and an important one. Uh, in general, so I, we have not prone, we have, we have proned uh, in, on ECMO uh, mostly, I'll start with that part of the question, uh, mostly to gain the experience doing it because as the literature accumulates and suggests a significant benefit with uh, proning during ECMO for ARDS suggests, and we don't know that definitively yet, this is all uh, matching studies, um, but there are a couple of strong ones uh, suggesting benefit. Um, you know, we wanted to have the experience so we can participate in the prone ECMO trial, which is also being planned by Matthew Schmidt. He's uh, on fire these days. So, um, yeah, so we, we do it, but we haven't done it much. We do, though, uh, uh, prone patients who have tracheostomy in general with ARDS. And so, um, you know, very fresh trach, I'd be quite careful, uh, you know, in those first, uh, you know, couple of days after trach. If it's a very stable trach, uh, even soon after we might do it, but really protect it. But once it's a week out, you can generally... Uh, pretty safely do that. Again, as long as the trach is stable, if this is somebody you put in an XL, uh, you know, uh, trach to, uh, because it was a, you know, difficult, they have a very thick neck, I, that may not be the person to do it. And um, certainly not until there's a real track there, but, um, but it definitely can be done. Lots of questions on cytokine adsorption or removal. Do you believe okay. in it? Do you do it? Do you use cytosorb? Do you use some other equipment? So I'm trying to remember or just just did an editorial on a paper. I'm trying to remember if the paper's out or not, uh, because it's if it's not, I, I don't know, maybe we can look this up quickly. But uh, if somebody can Google Alex Supady, S U P A D Y. Uh, he just uh, is either about to or just published um, a uh, a really nicely done study, on a randomized trial, small numbers. It was meant to be a pilot study for a larger study. Uh, with uh, cytokine absorption during ECMO for, uh, in COVID patients or primarily COVID patients. And uh, if you can find that it's out, then I'll talk about the results. If not, I'll just say that it's a cautionary tale. And um, if anybody who's considering it needs to find that study when it's out and really consider whether or not we should be doing that at this time without further evidence. So um, I know there's been a lot of enthusiasm for it. Remember that when we remove cytokines, first of all, uh, you know, cytokines are not all bad. Cytokines are part of a, an entire milieu, some of which is good, some of which is bad. It's all very complex. It's an interplay between many different factors in the body. If we would just remove them, remove some of what's good, some of what's bad, and it's hard to anticipate what the results are gonna be. So cytokine removal in general should have good evidence behind it. The evidence in uh, other areas has been, um, you know, a little bit mixed. Uh, and this is our, our, our first really good evidence in this area. And as I say, it's, it, uh, it is definitely something to be careful about. And um, I would not do it without reviewing this uh, study and deciding whether or not you think it's worthwhile. Terrific. Well, I've been hogging the questions. Uh, we're going to take a break in a second. But one last thing that I really wanted to point to is the paradigm that you've changed in ECMO is basically one where you go, uh, you've, you've ventilated it initially, they failed that. Um, you went on ECMO, VV ECMO for uh, respiratory type ARDS type syndrome, and then you turn the lung, uh, you, you utilize lung protective strategies, which help the lungs heal quicker while you are on VV ECMO. And, and then when the patient, uh, after a period of time, looked like the x-rays were better, they were passing gases better with their anatomical lungs, instead of going back up on the ventilator, which some people did, would still do, you would actually go to normal, normalized ventilator settings, whatever that is, still minimal, and then come off ECMO and not ever have to re-recruit re with high settings on ventilator again. I wanted you to summarize that real briefly because it's something that's still being violated across the board. Yeah, I mean, I think, 
you're, you're hitting on really sort of the key topics is it, once we understand that uh, the best way to treat an ARDS lung is uh, to treat it very gently, uh, you know, and that a ventilator is really a terrible instrument for, uh, for uh, treating injured lungs, uh, but we don't have a choice normally, right? So we put people on a ventilator, not because we want to, but because we have to. And positive pressure ventilation uh, is really, I mean, it's just blowing up a balloon and it's the opposite of what we do naturally. Right now, as I speak, I am negative pressure ventilating. I'm like a bellows pulling air into my lungs. So positive pressure now in the operating room for a few hours and somebody with normal lungs, makes almost no difference there. You can see changes, but makes almost no difference. But if you take somebody with injured lungs and you put them on high settings, you will make that injury much worse. And again, you're not just injuring the lungs. Remember biotrauma, you're releasing mediators that cause distal organ uh, injury and you cause multi-organ uh, dysfunction. And that's how 90%, at least 90% of patients with ARDS die. And so um, both on the, you know, on the front end and on the back end, as you're recovering, um, when you come up from these very low settings, the ultra protective ventilation, you really don't want to go to settings higher than you need. And so exactly as Bill's describing, we'll make our way back up uh, as the compliance of the lung improves over time, as we see the gas exchange improving, uh, we will make our way back up to ventilator settings that we would be happy to come off of. So over time, we get to settings that we think are still lung protective. Um, and if we can't get there, we'll, well, the patient's not ready to come off. And of course, that's balanced against if they're bleeding like crazy and you know we have some terrible complication of ECMO, you know, you're more likely to, much more likely to come off earlier. Um, and that becomes part of the risk benefit calculation. But if you have the luxury of time, you'll wait until these patients are uh, well enough that you can come off to reasonable lung protective settings um, and then wean them from the ventilator from there. Um, of course, if you're talking about your earlier question, if you've extubated them during ECMO, um, you might already have them off. And so now you're just uh, look, assessing the patient and their level of comfort off sweep. If they can breathe comfortably without increased work of breathing and they can maintain that, uh, then that's a patient who can be weaned from ECMO as well. Terrific. Um, does anybody else on the panel before we go for a break? And I think that the uh, Alexander Supati, we're looking for him, S-U-P-A-D-Y, we're looking for that lecture, is that right? Yeah, it, it would be a, a recent publication on, on Cytosor. Or set of I think somebody, I think it's, uh, well, there's a comment on it. Yeah, I don't know. Well, okay. all right. But I'm either way, it, it's it. something to look up. Yeah, sorry. I'm going to post it on the website. Thanks, Carla. Thanks That's for your Thanks, Carla. Yeah. Um, you know what? I have about 100 more questions, but we have no time. So <laughs> I really want to thank you from the, the bottom of my heart for joining us. I know you're uh, quite desirable as a speaker. And uh, the Sanibel Symposium, all our, all of our, uh, uh, we have over, I don't know, four or five, six hundred people on from around the world. We really appreciate all the information you bring us, and we really encourage you to continue in your endeavor to uh, um, bring us to up up the standards of quality ECMO care, uh, VV, VA, but really in that arts type situation, because like you said, the adult ECMO has just exploded, and we need to be teaching this as more community hospitals become involved with ECMO and this procedure becomes more standardized across the board. So again, we thank you from uh, we thank you for joining us today in this busy schedule. And I know you won't be with us later on, but I'll be in touch, you know, so. <laughs> this was really, it was an honor to finally be able to uh, join you for this great conference. So thank you very much.